Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Monday, May 21st, Market Watchers Live show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's take a quick look at the market action so far today. Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 270 points, the S&P 500 up 17, the NASDAQ up 35 points, the Russell 2000 continuing its winning ways, up about 10 and a half points today. 10-year Treasury yield up very slightly, sitting at 3.07%. Volatility index is relatively flat today, but continues in this downtrend. Industrials uh, have been much stronger here over the past couple of weeks, adding to that today, breaking out above that mid-April high and uh, leading in terms of sector performance today. Aerospace stocks talked about these guys last Friday, doing extremely well again today. The reason, or at least one of the big reasons, Boeing up another $11.5 today after breaking out above some consolidation on Friday, continuing that move to the upside. Also, General Electric GE, we've been talking about the uh, strength that has been uh, reflected in the GE chart here of late, and it continues today. There was an announcement with Wabtech. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But you can see Wabtech WAB also up very nicely today. Finally, Transport's making the big breakout above 10,800. This has been a key area of resistance I've been writing about, talking about. We are getting that breakout at least on an intraday basis. So let's see whether or not that holds into today's close. Well, uh, for the next couple of days, uh, Aaron will not be with me. So I do have a co-host, and that is Julius de Campanar. Welcome, Julius. How are you doing today? Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, happy to be here, and I'm doing well. Yeah, it's uh, going to be a little little different with not uh, having Aaron here, but I will say this. You are the author and creator of the RRG chart, so we're going to be taking a lot, lot of different looks and in, into how you can use RRG charts over the next couple of days. And so I think it'll be a really exciting couple of days here. Looking forward to it. Um, how are things going over in the Netherlands? I'm assuming that's where you're stationed right now. I am still in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Yeah, beautiful day here. Uh, I'll try to uh, do as much as Aaron does. Um, I'm not having a coffee right now because it's like six o'clock in the evening. So I have a water with me, uh, but the sun is out. We have a beautiful day here. Um, and, um, you know, as we agreed, Tom, I'm just going to be, you know, be beautiful and try to be funny while you talk. So um, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck. I hope uh, hope things work out there for you. <laughs> it is pretty cool, though, having you in from the Netherlands. That's one thing that just amazes me with all of this and technology is being able to get together, not just the two of us, but also everybody watching and listening worldwide. It's pretty cool. But uh, anyhow, we got a lot to go over and I know we got uh, some segments we want to get to and not short change. So let's get going with this, today's schedule. Uh, we do have um, the workshop coming up tomorrow in Julius. I'm putting you on the spot, but I want you to talk a little bit about RRG and give us some some uh, some of the basics for those who maybe aren't familiar with RRG. Maybe you can do that tomorrow during that workshop. And yeah, I, I was already afraid you were going to ask that, but that's fine. No problem. So you have to do more than just be pretty and funny. Now you actually exactly. have to do Yeah, well. got work to, work to do. There you go. Uh, we've got uh, Dave Keller coming in on, on Wednesday and uh, later this week on Friday, everything stock charts will be returning. We'll get one of the folks at Stock Charts to give you some interesting tips about how you can use the website. Next Monday is Memorial Day, so we've got U.S. stock market closed. So we will not be here next Monday, but we do want to wish everybody happy Memorial Day and thanks to everyone for their service. Uh, today's agenda, uh, let's jump right in. We got Monday set up, so we don't have Aaron. And of course, last week's kind of interesting because last week we had Aaron and we had Bruce Fraser on, so I've got their picks so I can roast them. Uh, without them knowing. Uh, well, maybe, they, maybe they're listening. I don't know. Anyway, we've got Earnings Spotlight. John Hopkins will be returning today, and we'll talk about some stocks that reported last week, along with some that John finds uh, especially intriguing. 10 in 10, Foot Locker will be our first today. And uh, this is going to be pretty cool, the way we're going to do the 10 in 10 today, because as your stock selections or as your uh, tickers come in to the chat room, uh, Julius is going to take those and going to enter them into an RRG chart. And then he's going to pick the remaining nine stocks based on how they look in terms of rotation. And then we'll pull the charts up and take a look at them. I think it'll be really cool. And then we're going to finish today with technical scans. Julius is going to talk to you a little bit about scans and how you can find your scans and then use the RRG maybe to zero in on some interesting uh, stocks. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. We got a lot going on here. Okay, uh, first... Do want to get into 
the 10 year treasury yield. Uh, this is where we like to start the day. There was really no economic news of any substance out today. And as a result, bond markets not really doing anything. They probably could have just closed today. Uh, relatively flat, sitting 3.07%. But we do remain in this uptrend, which I think is important because that means money is rotating out of bonds. And as long as this continues, and uh, well, there, there are definitely some repercussions in the market as far as which areas to really be paying attention to because the interest sensitive groups uh, are going to, to vary you know, back and forth depending on on what happens with the rates. But, you know, some of the financials like the banks, um, life insurance, uh, maybe the asset managers, investment services, those types of areas within financials tend to do very well when the yield is rising. And then you get on the flip side, areas that maybe struggle when you've got rising rates, you got to think about REITs and utilities. Both of those groups uh, depend a lot on their dividends. And as treasury yields rise, that offers up some competition. And so those dividends don't look nearly as attractive for investors when the 10-year treasury yield is rising. So anyhow, I uh, just want to point out a few of those things. Let's talk about what's going on in the market today. Um, over the weekend, U.S. Treasury Secretary said that all tariffs with China would be halted as the two companies uh, get together and talk. And as a result, futures were very strong heading into the action today. You can see the Dow Jones Industrial Average trying to close back above 25,000. We haven't seen a close above 25,000 since back in the middle of March. So it's been more than two months. So uh, the market certainly took this as good news. The S&P 500 also uh, doing very well with this news, trying to break out above the high it saw last week. And clearly that would be a uh, breakout to about a two month high as well. The NASDAQ continues to perform well on a relative basis. You can see easily clearing those April highs holding above it. We've gotten the golden cross with the 20 day moving through the 50. So the NASDAQ looking pretty good. And then of course, uh, the Russell 2000 and the S&P 600 small cap index. These are the two strongest areas of the market. Here you can see the Russell 2000. This breakout has occurred above 1600, which cleared the prior highs and, and uh, set up the Russell 2000 to move to all time highs. Also, if we pull up the uh, dollar SML, which is the S&P 600 small cap index, you'll see the same thing, breaking out to all-time highs. The reason for it, in my opinion, the biggest reason for it is the dollar has been on a tear to the upside. If you pull up the UUP, you'll see over the course of the last five to six, six weeks, the dollar has been straight up with barely a pause. We did uh, about a week and a half ago pull back for a few days, but it wasn't much. You can see uh, not much volume on the pullback in this um, dollar index bullish fund, and then right back to new highs. I think this is going to continue. Talked many times about this, but as long as the rates here in the U.S. are rising faster than what we're seeing in Germany, and right now they are, it is not unusual at all for the dollar to move higher. Here is the correlation that shows us that the difference between the U.S. Treasury yields and Germany's uh, yields, that whatever direction we're heading, uh, we are I'm showing the correlation versus the dollar. And you can see that the, the correlation remains in positive territory almost all the time, suggesting that the dollar is going to go whichever way U.S. Treasury yields are going relative to Germany. And right now you can see it is straight up. And after a little bit of negative correlation, which is very unusual, we've seen that three times in the last decade. Each of the prior two times, we had massive moves in the dollar back to the upside to play catch up. And I think that is what's going on right here. And it's got a lot of room to the upside on the dollar. So this is a trade that I think, uh, or at least a theme that uh, I would continue to trade as long as it's there, as long as it continues to work. And right now it has certainly been working. So the small caps, I think will continue to outperform so long as this dollar keeps rising the way it has been. A couple of the stories out today, General Electric first. Uh, we've talked about this, uh, Aaron and I both have talked about the improving technicals on GE. I like this big volume gap up to test overhead resistance. Throughout the downtrend, we rarely saw GE move back up to test prior highs. We kept setting lower highs and lower lows. But with this move on heavy volume, you can see we actually got up to test this prior high, failed, pulled back one more time, hit gap support. Look at that reversing candle, that piercing candle right on the 20-day moving average. And now we've broken out again. I think this is a very bullish development for GE on the chart. Look at the volume already today. 
36 million shares. Uh, I think this breakout is certainly worth uh, considering. I think that the strength that we're seeing in GE right now is likely to continue in the short to intermediate term and uh, probably look back to the weekly chart. But I think a run back to 19 on GE is very possible. And what we may see set up is a left shoulder, neckline, head, move all the way back up. We're getting through this 20-week moving average. I don't see maybe a little bit of a pause at 17, which is where the last breakout, or excuse me, breakdown occurred. But if we get through 17, I would look for 19 and a test of that declining 50-week moving average. And from there, I think that will tell us a little bit more about the long term on GE, whether or not it truly is a long term bottom. Uh, but GE, the, the announcement today with uh, Wabtech, um, they are combining transport operations into a separate entity. The GE shareholders are going to own 50 point, I want to say it's like 50.01 percent and Wabtech 49.99, something like that. Very slight. Um, ownership edge for GE shareholders. It is a non-taxable transaction for both company shareholders. And uh, I believe GE pulls out $2.9 billion in cash at the closing of this deal. So market viewed it very favorably for both companies. As I showed you on the daily chart, here's GE gapping up above resistance. And if we take a look at Wabtech, this one was already uh, being bid up we had already seen a breakout about a month ago here on very heavy volume. Uh, the 84, 85 area had acted as some pretty solid overhead resistance, but we went right through, came back, tested it along with the rising 20 day, took off, and then the news came out and you can see the volume pouring in on this move to the upside on Wabtech. So clearly this is being viewed as a bullish development for both companies. Uh, Micron boosted their guidance, MU. They, uh, I think they've got an investor and analyst event coming up, but they did boost their guidance and they cited strong execution and favorable, healthy industry conditions. They raised their earnings per share from $2.84 up to a range of $3.12 to $3.16. So that was a pretty hefty hike, about 10% on the EPS. Stock was up a little bit more earlier, challenging the recent high. I think Micron looks much better technically. I think the consolidation phase has ended. I believe we're now uptrending again. So I would be watching this 52 area as pretty solid support on any pullback. To the upside, you want to get a breakout above 57 and make another push for about 62 to test that March high. That's going to be a big level to try to get through, though, because with earnings, when it came out with its earnings, it gapped up. You can see, look at the volume on the selling, that black candle, the selling that took place. So it's going to be very difficult to get through 62. That would be my target. I have to see it climb above that uh, before I would get back in. Uh, mentioned the transports earlier. Certainly worth mentioning again. Transports clearing this 10,800 level. Hopefully you can see this on the chart. This is a pretty big deal because we have moved up on multiple occasions. We've been above 10,800 probably on about three or four different occasions without the ability to close there. Today, we opened below 10,800, got as high as 10,910. We're sitting at 10,887. A strong finish here would be very bullish. And when we look at the different areas of the transports, first, let's pull up the uh, truckers. Truckers looked like they were breaking down recently. And I, I think if we had Bruce Fraser on, he might talk about this being a possible spring where you move up, you go through like a re-accumulation phase. Uh, have a false breakdown. Normally, when you break down below a key support level like this, you come back up, you either fail at the uh, resistance level or maybe at the declining 20-day. Truckers did neither. We went right through both of them, which I think is a great sign. Continues to move up, and it is not far now from challenging the high established back in late January. But even better than the truckers are the railroads. Railroads already made the breakout above January, pulled back, uh, retested that area of the breakout, and have now for the last five days moved higher, breaking out to yet another new high. And if you pull up the long-term monthly, 15-year monthly chart on railroads, you'll see this is a major breakout to another all-time high on the railroad. So very, very strong action in those two areas within transports. Of course, the one area that has been lagging continues to lag are the airlines. We are trying to close at about a one month high, maybe four week high. 
Um, but still, that overall downtrend in the airlines has uh, still pretty pronounced. Part of it could be crude oil prices, although uh, what's interesting, you think, okay, high crude oil prices are obviously going to be a big expense line item for the airlines, but they do hedge against that. Um, if you take a look at the correlation, I thought I'd maybe just show you this real quick uh, just to see, all right, what, what happens to airlines you know, with uh, crude oil prices? And uh, I'm going to go back. Let's look at the last 10 years. I think you might find this to be somewhat interesting. We pull this up and look at the correlation. I'm not really seeing positive or negative correlation here. You, you would think that crude oil might be something that would be, you know, maybe a lot of maybe inverse correlation as crude oil prices go down. That would be a good thing for airlines and airlines would go up. But the correlation chart here actually doesn't uh, show us that at all. In fact, over the past 10 years, I'd say that it's kind of equally distributed between positive and negative correlation. And currently right now it is negative, but um, you know, maybe, maybe it's having an imp impact, but I wouldn't use this as a recipe for trying to project where the airlines are going to go. Because as you can see over the last 10 years, there really hasn't been any uh, tremendous uh, or strong correlation. Let's take a look at some of the Dow stocks. Um, Boeing mentioned Boeing earlier, uh, getting up to 360. It is now challenging that February high, very strong chart. You look at it and you think, well, you know, when we were moving lower that maybe this wasn't good, but keep in mind when you make a big move to the upside, you know, Arthur Hill did a great article not that long ago, uh, may have been in the chart watchers talking about these big moves to the upside. They deserve big periods of consolidation, maybe a little bit more selling. And when you look at a stock like Boeing and pull up a weekly chart, this is, I think, kind of what Arthur was referring to. When you get a big move like this, you know, selling off for a period of time, maybe a little bit more than you're accustomed to, is not that big a deal. Um, I think if we can get a breakout, get some volume going, I think Boeing could continue to push higher. We do want to be careful, though. Now we do have a negative divergence in play on a breakout uh, on the weekly chart. Now, that doesn't mean that it's immediately going to go down. In fact, I wouldn't be too concerned with it if it's a heavy volume breakout, unless we get a reversing candle or the breakout level fails to hold. That would start to change things, especially if there was a negative divergence in play. GE went over. I'm not going to go over that again. Another stock that's been doing very well in the Dow, Intel. Um, Intel, here we go. Trying to get back through 55. You can see multiple attempts. Clearly, a breakout above 55 and a quarter or so on a close with some volume is what Intel is currently looking for. Um, on the S&P 500, certainly worth mentioning Chesapeake, CHK. This was the top percentage gainer when I was looking earlier in the S&P. It is up six and a quarter percent. But this huge move, we did have a dark cloud cover candle on Friday. And short term, that can be a problem. We're just trading inside that candle right now. I'm not sure if this move uh, continues without at least a pullback, maybe to 360, 370 to test this rising 20 day moving average. I'd, I'd feel a lot better about entry into Chesapeake on a pullback than I would chasing this move. Um, last thing I wanted to mention on, as far as stocks go, I did uh, in my blog this morning write about the autos, talk about maybe this is a, a time when autos can get going. Tesla earlier was the top performer in the NASDAQ 100, but it has uh, fallen off of its earlier high. So that may no longer be the case. But Tesla still up about 3% today. You can see testing overhead gap resistance and that 20 day moving average. You want to get back through that 20 and through that gap resistance to really get things going with Tesla. And then the last thing before we move on to the Monday setups, I do want to talk about is just briefly uh, if you go into the blog articles, this was a chart watchers weekend. So if you pull up the Chart Watchers blog, you will see a number of articles that just came out over the weekend. There's John Hopkins article from Earnings Beats. John will be with us in about 15 minutes. Uh, you've got uh, John Murphy's articles. Most of John's work uh, is behind the paywall here at Stock Charts. Uh, I think the only place you really can get some of John's work, current work, is by subscribing to Chart Watchers, which is a free newsletter. If you're unaware, you, you've not uh, really, um, you, you didn't realize that Chart Watchers uh, was out there. Let me get a quick, uh, you go back to the blog page. On the right-hand side here, 
you can see a, a green sign up button, type in your email address, click that sign up button. This is the first thing you should do at Stock Charts is become a member uh, or a subscriber of the Chart Watchers newsletter. You're going to get a lot of great information. It comes out twice a month and uh, will really help you in terms of managing the stock market and uh, setting up your portfolio and so forth. So with that, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, we do have a special Monday set up today because we've got a special guest, Julius DeCampenar, joining us. But before I get Julius's pick for this week, let's go over some of what happened last week. Uh, we do have, uh, we did, did have uh, Bruce Fraser joining Aaron last week and their picks for the week. I haven't even looked at them, but uh, we've got RL for Aaron. We got ESIO for Bruce. And mine was kind of a mail-in pick. I think they got mine from the blog, uh, KSS. That actually was not, that was a typo. I forgot to have that changed. I think it was maybe 6023 or 6123. Um, we'll pull up the chart and take a look at it in just a minute. But let me pull up all three of these, RL, ESIO, and KSS. So bear with me one second while we get this set up. All right, RL, well, first, let me congratulate Aaron. Great pick, Aaron. Um, about a week ago, 111 or so, here we are at 117 and change. Really good pick for the week. It is getting up near this overhead resistance level and probably getting yeah, a little overbought. So it might pull back a little bit. Certainly, I, I would imagine uh, on Aaron's PMO, it's probably very similar to this PPO which is strengthening, moving higher. So momentum is accelerating on RL. This one is uh, certainly looks like a good candidate. Although again, overhead resistance, from my perspective, I would take profits and see if I could get back in cheaper. Uh, Bruce picked ESIO. And uh, had tried a few times to make breakouts, but it looks like relatively flat for the week. Um, but I would, what I would continue to do here is look for this breakout uh, volume. Actually, volume looks like maybe it's picking up a little bit today. So if we can move back and close above 20 today, I would think that would be a little bit more of a bullish uh, candle. And so that's what I would look for there. And then finally, Coles was the one I picked last Monday for my blog. I'm sure that's where uh, we got that from. Whoops. see if we can get that. Here we go. Uh, yeah, I think it was down around this. Uh, maybe it was 61, uh, 20 or so. But anyway, it is up at 65.13, so another one having a pretty good week. Uh, so all in all, pretty good setups. Uh, as far as KSS goes, I do like the fact that the pullback held the rising 20, and we're getting this crossover, the 20 coming back up, trying to get that golden cross above the 50. Did get a little bit of volume coming in uh, last week on the push back up above 64. So all in all, pretty good action. But again, to the upside, I think you get up to about 68, maybe just above 68, that's going to be a problem four coals in the longer term. I would not assume we go right through. I would be selling it at 68-ish and waiting either on a pullback or confirming that breakout before I would re-enter. So with that, that was a look at last week, but we're only as good as our last pick, Julius, and we're going to put you on the spot this week since you are here. What do you have for a Monday setup for everybody today? <laughs> well, let me let me start to say that my um, my horizon uh, I've made it a little bit shorter than what I usually do because, as you know, my everything I do on RRG is pretty much is a little bit longer term orientated. So I look for longer term sector rotations. But for this particular occasion, I decided um, to shorten my time frame a little bit. Let me let me grab my screen. Uh, yeah. Just want to be crazy like me, be a short-term trader. Yeah, I'm going to be crazy like you. I'm going to go back to a little bit of swing trading. I used to do a lot of that um, pretty long time ago. Um, yeah, went to do my stuff with RRG, worked with institutional investors whose holding period is normally a little bit or often a lot longer than what um, retail investors are uh, are using. Um so um, yeah, I, I know my stuff. It's a little bit rusty, um, but let's see what we uh, what we can come up with. Right. Um, for this exercise, um, I thought it would be cool to get a little bit out of my comfort zone, so to say, and, and not only use RRG, but go back to a number of tools that I used um, a long time ago, and maybe I should start using them a little bit more often. And um, 
that's one of the things that I want to talk to you later on when we're talking about scans, because I'm going to take you on my little learning road um, uh, with the scan engine on stockcharts.com. So for my Monday setups, um, that's a little bit of a combination between RRG and the setups that we will talk about later on. Now, the first one that I want to look at is Colgate. It, was, it came out of my scan. And as you can see, I've shortened my time frame to daily. Um, on the RRG, it's still very, very weak. I mean, the RS ratio is still way down there, but momentum is starting to move higher. And the, the drop in relative momentum seems to have stopped. And what we've seen here um, is that the downtrend is obviously still intact, but you know, the lows are lower, but it's it's losing downward momentum. So this is something that I'd like to look at. And then I look at a number of my charts that I have here under my um, uh, buttons. Um, you know, if you look at the longer term picture, it's not the greatest chart, Colgate, but it's, it's resting at a long term support level. So that's Kind of good. It's not fantastic, but it's kind of good. For trend follower, this would be nothing, but I'm looking for bounces here. Um, so quickly look at some indicators. I'm not a big indicator guy, but I you know, like to use MACD and RSI, just like pretty much anybody else, I think. And what I see here is that we've got a little bit of a bottom forming in the MACD, and I like divergences. So um, the, the RSI is diverging in a positive way, so that's another, that's another good thing. And it's very close to um, uh, the scan results that I will present to you later. And I, I won't you know, give away what I'm looking for right now, but this one came out. Um, it's not my best pick because of the weak relative strength and the weaker longer term picture. The second one that I'm looking at is CTSH. CTSH. H. Um, we stick with this screen here. Um, you see a little bit of divergence. MACD not quite there yet, but the divergence is good. And what I like is that this is a short term trade, 70, 70, 78, 79 could be possible, maybe closing the gap all the way up to 80. If I look at the longer term bar, then this uptrend is very much intact. And if I draw a trend line here, it's probably just testing that long-term support line. So I'm good with that. Um, the weekly makes it a little bit more clear. We're resting at a horizontal support level, which comes of this previous high, which was late last year, um, which is good. So you could put your stops anywhere, you know, between 75, 72 and a half. Um, so I like that one. And then if I look at the um, RRG indicators, it's weakening, but it's still, it's still uh, above 100 on the weekly scale. And if we put that on the daily, let's see what we got here. We see that the, the fast drop in relative strength has started to level off a little bit. RS ratio way down, but we're curling up on the momentum scales. It's a little bit sketchy, it's a little bit a gamble, but we've seen the longer term picture. I like the fact that it's resting at this former resistance level that now comes back as support. So it would be one of the things that I would be looking at. But my pick, Tom, for the week is actually Coca-Cola. Um, if we look at this chart here, um, we're still with the, the daily. Let me go back to the daily here. We see that momentum is improving relative, not the greatest chart uh, in the universe, I'd say. We're still at relatively low levels for the RS ratio. Momentum is curling up, but I like the fact that we're not really breaking down. We're testing this support level, and this could become a nice double bottom with quite some upside potential. I mean, you could go all the way back to 45, which is the upside of the range that we've seen since February this year. Um, let's look at the longer term picture. So the real long term bar, this is a 15 year chart. Again, this seems to be resting at a long term support level. If I draw this trend line here and, um, you know, trend lines, you can make them as subjective as you like, you know, the, the thicker your, your, your adding marker, the better it provides support. But just by eyeballing, you can see that this is still putting in higher highs and higher lows. And this seems to be forming 
a new higher low, which is what I like. So we're, we're in this long-term uptrend. We're bouncing against long-term support. And that's where I like to pick it up. So, you know, this is the, this is the test that we're looking at. Um, pretty good. And then if we look at the, um, the daily bar, six months daily, then we'll see that it is very close to breaking above. Well, let's round it off around 42.50. And then the next, the next stops probably somewhere 43, 70, 44, and then it's all the way up to 45. So for the short term, Coca-Cola is my pick guys. Awesome. All right. Well, there's something to, for everybody to think about. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to throw my first pick. I'm just going to go right into it. This is going to be the one that I use for this week. And it is Garmin. It was in my blog this morning. And I tell you, I've had a history of seeing these move up, you know, after I put them in my blog. And then I, I go away from them because I don't like the fact that it's already up for the week. And I end up picking up something else and it never works. So I'm just going to stick with what I had in my blog, which is Garmin. The price right now is at $60.38. So we'll see where it is by this time next Monday. But I like it. I like the fact that we got the gap up. This was earnings related. We had a huge gap to the upside. Got up as high as 62 and a half. And then after earnings, like so many stocks do, we worked our way all the way back down to gap support. So this is uh, maybe a little bit of a lesson in having some patience with these stocks when they gap up with solid earnings, because many times you will get the opportunity to get in back at that lower price. I know it doesn't seem like it at the time. Everybody gets really excited. But keep in mind, when everybody wants to buy, you've got market makers on the other side that have to provide the liquidity and they short. And market makers over time make money. So when they're shorting, typically most of the time, not all the time, they do take losses on trades. But most of the time, they're going to make money on their trades. And if they're shorting, you don't want to be buying. And so Garmin, I think, came back down, all the way back down to fill the gap. I think at this point, you start getting market makers um, those that bought at the top are selling, panicking when they fall, you know, when they lose two, three dollars on these trades. And then market makers are building their own positions, their inventory. And then we start to see the move back to the upside. So I'm looking for Garmin to make another run for 62. Ultimately, I think we're going to run up to 64, 64 and a half to challenge the, the uh, February high off of the solid earnings that we saw just a few weeks ago. To the downside, I'd really like to see this gap support hold around 59. Uh, another possible way of trading this would be a second entry because you can see major long, longer term or more intermediate term support down at 57 and a half. So possibly a second entry would be 57 and a half with a, probably a stop no more than a dollar beneath that on a closing basis. But ultimately, I do see Garmin making another run for 64, 64 and a half. So I like Garmin. That's going to be the pick that I go with for this week. But I do have a couple others that I'll just show you quickly. One is Johnson Controls, JCI. Uh, had a really nice earnings report back earlier in May. Uh, I think kind of changes the character of this chart. Pulls back on a little bit lesser volume, although Friday's volume wasn't too light, but it did hold on to that rising 20-day. This is where I would look for it to reverse back to the upside. So you can keep a fairly tight stop. If it closed back below the 20, I'd probably take a pretty uh, small loss here. UIS, which is Unisys. After a big move up earnings related in early May, look at the sideways consolidation. I think we got a little bit of a flag. I would look for a breakout above 1230 to confirm the next move higher here. And then finally, the last one I have is Brinker's EAT. A beautiful move up, sideways consolidation right above this 20. I think gap support at about 4275 is likely to hold. And I would be looking for a return back up to 47. So those are the Monday setups for this week. Julius has got, he's on the limb, out on that limb now with uh, Coca-Cola for one week. And I'm out there with Garmin, which is uh, ticker symbol G-R-M-N. And the uh, other stocks you can see on the summary slide here uh, for Julius and for me. So there we go. Uh, we're on, we're out there now, Julius, till next week. The, the thing is, though. You yeah, tell me. Yeah, you're not going to be here for it. So I'm the, <laughs> I'm the one who has to, to show back up and be here for the show when my pick uh, goes awry. I am 100% sure that people know how to find me on my blog and put it some something in the comments, whether they like it or not. And I just don't worry about it, guys. I can handle all that.
Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big boy. Yep. And uh, just definitely, if you're going to trade any of these, do your own due diligence. Make sure you're comfortable with it. Uh, I am not a, uh, um, a registered investment advisor. I don't uh, give out picks. Of course, there's no way for Julius and I to know everybody's personal financial situation. So just make sure you're comfortable and you keep your stops in play. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and move on to the earnings spotlight. This earnings spotlight is brought to you by earningsbeats.com. Earningsbeats.com provides high reward to low risk trade candidates. Earningsbeats.com only trades companies that have beaten Wall Street estimates as to quarterly revenues and earnings. And they'll teach you to focus on that strong combination of fundamentals and technicals. Learn to exercise the patience and discipline of an experienced trading service. Earningsbeats.com, better timing, better trades. Welcome to the show, Mr. Hopkins. How are you doing? Good, Tom. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty darn good. Um, All right. Plain. It's my birthday. I know it. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, it's my after birthday. A while you, actually, after a while, you stop announcing them. Yeah, you know. You're I, not there yet. No. Well, I don't celebrate birthdays anymore anyway. I celebrate anniversaries. So I'm still 30. There you go. Yep. No more I like birthdays. It. I was actually in uh, New Orleans over the weekend. Oh, celebrating I, uh, my birthday. My brother-in-law turned 60. Oh, cool. So happy we had to go, you know, see him through it. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, you know, I had some things planned for this week because, um, I, you know, I'm going to stretch it out. I can't just do, do one day. I might as well, you know, take advantage of this for a week. Um, I don't do the whole month. I don't do the whole birthday month. I just do <laughs> the birthday week, but we'll see you know, what All happens. Right. Anyhow. We've got a, we've had a ton of earnings come out here, obviously, over the last month or so, and they're starting to slow down. We still have mm -hmm. some big ones coming out. And I just wanted to kind of touch on a few of these coming up this week. Um, just for everybody listening out there, we do have uh, TJX, uh, which is a big retailer coming out uh, tomorrow. Intuit reports tomorrow. Lowe's, the big uh, mm -hmm. uh, home improvement uh, store, kind of competes with Home Depot. Lowe's will be reporting on Wednesday. Target. Network Appliance, a couple of biggies that uh, report on Wednesday. Thursday, we got Medtronics and a couple of big financials, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. We got Toronto Dominion Bank, Ross Stores. So we still got some big companies, but the real behemoths, for the most part, have already, you know, reported. Yeah, they have report. I actually want to go over a, a couple that reported last week. OK. And uh, before I do that, I just want to. I have like an observation, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, the market, you know, the market's sort of hanging in, right? Um, it's not soaring, you know, but it's not collapsing. And I think the primary reason, Tom, is because, like you said, some of these um, very visible companies, they have uh, reported strong earnings. And overall, the earnings picture is strong. And I wanted to sort of mention one thing, one observation before we go over some stocks here. Um, you know, we track all the stocks that report earnings. Um, and we keep track of the earnings beats and the earnings misses. And I was looking at the list of stocks that we have on our chart list, about 150, a little over 150 on the beats list, companies that reported recently beat earnings, okay? And I could only come up with six that have pulled back enough since they reported that present a high enough reward to risk to consider putting out right now as a mm -hmm. trade. And I only bring that up because the point being that even before today, you know, when the market moved higher, um, but even though the market's been choppy, traders still continue to um, – gravitate to those companies that beat earnings. And I thought it was so interesting to see that, you know, so many were remaining at a lofty level. But there are also some companies that haven't done quite as well. We had a couple of companies last week, for example, that reported uh, earnings. And one was Agilent, uh, the symbol A, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is starting to potentially look like a short candidate, not quite yet, <laughs> okay? But look what happened. The stock reported, you can see what happened. It went down very substantial on a, on a huge bar, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's moving its way back up to the 20. I'm going to be a little bit patient with this one. See mm -hmm. if we can get this thing back to the 50-day. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, if we get close to the 50-day moving average, 
uh, that to me looks like it could be a decent uh, shorting candidate. Yeah, we've had some fake outs, though. I mean, yes, we have. I mean, the group I just pulled up earlier in the show. I mean, when you look at the truckers, you had, you know, really good support coming across here at about 780 to 790. We mm -hmm. got a gap down to the open May, went below, came back up. And, you know, I kind of agree with you. Normally, when you get these breakdowns and you get back to, say, gap resistance, mm -hmm. price resistance, the moving averages, you know, you start to turn back lower. But we've continued to move higher in the truckers. And, uh, you know, I don't uh, who knows what's going to happen with Agilent, but uh, I I'm sure you would agree with this. No matter whether you're long or short, you want to make sure you keep your stops in play. Yeah. You know, speaking of transportation, go to CP, you know, which is one that we had out as a short candidate. Take a look at that chart. See how it it sort of double topped. Mm -hmm. OK, we 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 had a very tight stop on it. Mm -hmm. So we exited, but my price target on it was the 50 day. And so you can see that it missed earnings. It made a nice move higher, but ultimately gravitated back. You know, uh, we had a tight stop on it, but which is like you said, the, you know, the very key. Um, but here's a case where it looked like a stock was going to break out and it stopped right at that double top there. Yeah, this is an interesting chart for Canadian Pacific Railway because you can see the tops that John's referring to right here. And right, it was right up against resistance. And I, when anytime you get that false breakout and it reverses and can't make the breakout, yeah. mm -hmm. that is typically a pretty good sign that the stock's going to come back, which it did. But when you look here, part of what's holding the stock up, you know, as well as it is, is you've got a very strong railroad group. Um, mm -hmm. So that that is helping. But when you look at the relative strength within the peer within its peers. Uh, CP is performing horribly and it's at a relative low right now versus the railroads. And that's because the railroads have broken out while CP has, has pulled back. Now, I'd be a little careful with it from a standpoint of the group is so strong mm -hmm. right now, breaking out to all time highs that it would be difficult to short it. Certainly after it's already pulled back, I, I think we make. Oh, it yeah. Yeah. It already did its thing. A couple of others that reported last week worth looking at one okay. is applied materials. All right, a mat. Yep. And you can see, you know, the breakdown there uh, on very large volume. So this would be another one. I, I wouldn't do anything with it now. You know, it's gotten punished pretty well. But the, the point being, we're in a kind of market, Tom, where you don't have to just be long stocks, okay? You can also short stocks. It's just the opposite of what we do when we're looking at the long side. Company reports, it goes down on big volume, hits a key support level, maybe, uh, you know, over the next week or two, bounces some to a key resistance level, and we keep a tight stop on it. But you can see AMAT uh, was having some trouble. Yeah, this is one, uh, you know, it had negative divergences in play as it kept rising here on the weekly chart. You can see the, the uh, PPO kept falling. So I'm not surprised that it actually pulled back with its earnings. Um, I was, I've been kind of watching this one, but I, I view that longer term support area closer to 47, 47 and a half. We'll see if that level goes. I, I'm a, I'm a bull. I think the market's going higher. So it's mm -hmm. really difficult for me to get behind too many shorts at this point. Um, but it's always harder to short. Trust me. <laughs> there's no doubt, especially in a market that's moving up. And, and I agree with you. I think there has been a lot of choppiness in the market, unless you're looking at say the small caps where yeah. you look at the S and P 600, Mm -hmm. uh, this has been a huge move up here in the month of May, breaking to all-time highs. So I think it's just been more rotation towards small caps, yeah. rising dollar. Here's some, one more example of a stock that reported last week. On the other other end of the spectrum is Macy's M. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. you can see you, what you're seeing. I love this to be honest with you. I love when the market rewards companies that you know either exceed expectations or guide higher. Mm -hmm. And in a case where they miss or guide lower, it gets punished. I like that not every company's lumped into one you know, category. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should be. And you can see with Macy's, you know, um, when everybody just thought retail was dead, the stock has made a pretty good move. Yeah, and it's also interesting, too, that we're seeing, you know, these gap ups and gap downs occurring throughout, uh, see, you know, earnings season. And we're seeing it with stocks that technically don't look that bad. I mean, you know, if you go back to applied materials prior to the gap down, it was just sideways consolidating. Mm -hmm. Stock gaps down about 8% at the open. Uh, we go back to Agilent and the stock is kind of sideways consolidating and then it gaps down 10% at the open. And so it's kind of highlighting the fact that there's a lot of risk in holding these companies into their earnings. Absolutely. I, I won't do it. No. 
I've done it a few times and learned my lesson. So yeah, I, I avoid it. I'm always on the wrong side of that, that deal. Hey, a couple of other quickies here. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about, um, this was a company that was, uh, we do a chart of the week. It's free you know, for people to look at on the site. Anyways, one that we put out two weeks ago uh, was Micron, MU. Yep. Uh, right when the stock got down to about the 45, right there, right in that range, I loved the reward to risk there because if it went against us, you can move over towards March and see where, you know, the low had hit back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a very tight stop on it, okay? Um, and our and our price target was about 54 to 55. It blew through that, you know, got to 57. The stock went up 26%. Uh, so we would pegged the reward to risk on this from about 8 or 10 to 1, uh, upside to downside. And those are the kind of uh, stocks that we like to look at. Yeah, and Micron still looks pretty good. And I mentioned earlier in the show, they boosted their guidance ahead of an mm -hmm. investor and analyst event. And they specifically talked about uh, favorable industry conditions as one of the reasons why they were boosting their earnings per share. You see a nice gap up today, still trying to get above that recent price high from last week. But I think Micron's going to make a run for 62. I think I do. Yeah, I like the way it looks. And a couple of other quickies. One is FIVN. Okay. This is a this is a stock that we uh, put out last week, right right when it got down to that fifty day. Look at that beautiful move on the uh, earnings and the green bar, the volume bar, yep. and it pulled back so beautifully. You know, very calm volume. So we put it out uh, with a price target of thirty two fifty. Hit it today. Sweet. Uh, we would have gotten out if it had you know closed or gone much below that uh, fifty day. So there again. Just for everybody, you know, listening, if you're going to find a stock, always try to find a reward to risk three to one, four to one. If it goes against you, you know, you might lose a percent or two, but if it works in your favor, it might go up eight percent, ten percent. And if you keep doing that, and you and your technical analysis skills are good, you should come out ahead. Yeah, I, I think this is a pretty uh, interesting one that you could use almost like in a seminar or something to teach because. This is a nice reversing candle, number one, right at gap support, the moving averages. And this move back up to 32 literally occurred over about three or four trading days. And you start, you know, you buy a stock near 30 and get out 32 and change, and you can do that in three or four days. Uh, that adds to the, uh, to the return, no doubt. Then you're back in cash and you've got nothing at risk at that point. You've already locked in your gain. But, you know, when you look across the chart here, that close on earnings uh, day back in early May at 32 and a half or so, that poses very considerable considerable overhead resistance. So getting up here, moving above it intraday, if it were to close back below 32 and a half today, this is one that possibly, you know, you could get back in a dollar fifty cheaper or maybe yeah. dollar five back close to that 20 day. And last one I'd send on a, you know, one that looks like a potential short candidate with a tight leash is uh, Flex Limited, F L E X. And you can see, you know, how it gapped down sharply on big volume mm -hmm. and then made its way up right up to about the, you know, 20 day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so we made it the chart of the day as a short candidate with a very tight stop in case it, you know, closes over the 20. Uh, but I think if the market, you know, slows down or weakens here, I don't think this one's going to part necessarily participate uh, to the upside. So I think it's a potential short candidate with a tight leash. Yeah, definitely has not been performing well relative to its peers. It's not performing well relative to the S and P. Its its industry group is not performing very well relative to the S and P as well. Yeah, these are the kind. I mean, again, I don't like to short when I when I'm thinking it's the market's bullish. But that's just my own personal preference. I know there are a lot of folks that like to short throughout the year and if the situation arises, which uh, you know that's personal choice and that's fine. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know, when you get a big breakdown on heavy volume, I would anticipate that this 20 day moving average is not going to hold. Yeah. And again, you keep your tight stop. So, you know, Tom, for the first time in several years, mm -hmm. we have a batch of stocks on our candidate tracker that missed earnings. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that in a long time. And I think that in the choppy market um, and again, you know, you, it, I don't care what you say, Tom. I observed, as you have over the years, in a bullish market, when you're shorting stocks, you're going against the flow in a mm -hmm. bullish market, okay? But there are times, you know, when the market's choppy and maybe uncertain, um, when they report earnings, they sell off sharply, they make a, 
a little move to the upside, but you know, nothing convincing. And uh, you know, you can you can trade stocks both ways as long as you've got those tight stops, no matter if it's a long or short. Yep, I would totally agree. I just know from a from my own uh, <laughs> psyche, from my own psyche, it's difficult if you, if you're shorting and the market's going higher. That's the worst kind of a loss for me. I would rather be long and lose on a long trade. Yeah, short and lose on a short trade. But you know, again, yeah, okay. Offer. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get a quick summary, if we can, of uh, you know the various stocks that we just talked about. There were a bunch of them. Uh, I'm not going to go back over them, but we did go through a number of uh, stocks, and uh, it's always uh, always a pleasure to have you on here, my friend. I thank you very much. I wish you a happy anniversary, and uh, go Caps. Go Caps. Uh, well, that's right. That's the date. I'm, I'm afraid to even watch. <laughs> Don't jinx them. I'll see you. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you, John. Oh, my gosh. Why do we have to go in the Caps? They wouldn't dare lose the series on my birthday, would they? probably would. Anyhow, those are the stocks that we covered during the uh, earnings spotlight there that you can see. And it is time, Julius, to go into the 10 and 10. We are going to do this a little bit different today. Um, Julius has been working feverishly, um, putting in symbols into the RRG. Why don't you pull <laughs> that up, Julius, and maybe show us on an RRG if you have it. Um, what that yeah, let me quickly share my screen and then you can take it back when I um, went over. Because I mean, it's probably going to be too long if I do all my explanations uh, on on how and why. Yeah, um, what what looks interesting to you? Just looking at it. Quickly. Yeah, let me let me because this this is the RRG holding all the names that I've picked up from the chat box. So um, that's quite a lot, as you can see. And um, what I did is I quickly, as fast as I could, went over all these um, names and came up with. Um, uh, nine I had to look for names that you were gonna gonna take a look at um, shall I just because we don't have that much time to go over all of those um, let me just shorten this a little bit the ones that I thought were most interesting were um, Crocs is one that I like uh, it's in the leading quadrant on the weekly RRG we're looking at, but I also checked them against the dailies. Let's, let's put it on daily. That's probably for this occasion a better time frame. So um, here we go again. Symbol name Crocs. Here it is. Nice in the improving. You saw that it was already good in the weakening, moving into leading. So I think that's interesting. Um, Again, GE, no surprise, came up as potentially interesting. You see it on the daily. It's already rotating up there, which is what we very much like when it does stuff like this. So GE, uh, I have actually an alternate, Tom, because I know that you've been talking about GE all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I have an extra one if you want to skip this one. Um, the third one is Home Depot like Home Depot, it's in the weakening, but it's a very short tail and it started to move up very slightly. So I like that on the weekly, it's actually going straight through the middle uh, at a strong RRG heading, which makes me bullish. IPI is a stock that I would look at. Mm -hmm. You're taking notes, right? Uh, I wasn't actually, I am now. What was the one you had right after? Uh, Cause we're gonna do Foot Locker first. What then there's Crocs, C R O X. Crocs. Okay, I got gotcha. you. And then we have G. Yes. And then we have H D, Home Depot. Yep. And we're now looking at IPI. Okay. Again, one that's in weakening and turning back up. Okay. Always nice. Then we have J and J, Johnson and Johnson. Okay. Where are you here? It's in lagging, but turning up, and it looks pretty good on the weekly, so I'd like to look at that. Lulu is another one. Okay. Again, turning up, inside weakening, good on the weeklies. Um, and then we have WLL. All right. Very strong on the daily, very good looking on the weekly as well. Maybe a little bit overstretched, but it's strong on the RRGs. Then we have Nike. Yep. And K E and K E. So here you are, just back into the leading quadrant from weakening. Very nice. 
And then I, the last one is H O N. Where is it? Okay. Honeywell. Close to the benchmark, but at a strong RRG heading. And as a possible alternate for GE, I have XOM. Um, and that's quite interesting because I don't like it from a relative perspective against, uh, perspective against the energy sector, as I wrote in my blog uh, the other day. But actually, against the S&P 500, not surprisingly, XOM looks pretty cool because the sector is doing very well. So, you know, if you want to try to, to trade, you know, the large cap stuff, you know, XOM um, could be on your radar. But be aware that, at, at least in my humble opinion, there are better stocks in the energy sector than XOM. So take your pick. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go with your alternate of XOM because we have uh, talked thought so. a lot about GE. Yeah, I thought so. So no point in uh, bringing that one up again. But let's start off with Foot Locker, which was the first 10 and 10. And I believe they might be reporting earnings. And looking at this chart, it looks like maybe they reported back at the beginning of March. So they probably are getting ready to report again. So keep that in mind. Um, just in the short term, you can see the volume that picked up in mid-April as we sold off from around $45. And notice each time we've gotten up to $45, the selling is kicked in again. We need to get through 45. So if we can get through there, then I think we have a move maybe up another couple dollars, two and a half dollars to about 47. But for now, I, I'd be careful with it until we can get through this 44 and a half to 45 dollar level. So uh, not one of my favorites. I think that there are a lot of stocks out there that are doing pretty well that have solid momentum to the upside. Anytime you get a stock that's got a PPO like this for the last two or three months, that's uh, essentially is almost trading right on the center line. There's just not a lot of momentum and I'm a momentum trader. So this is going to be a difficult one for me, but let's keep moving. Uh, let's go on to Crocs. So this one was improving. I completely agree. And this is what's really nice about the RRG because it's kind of giving you the visual of the chart before you even see the chart. Um, what I like about Crocs is that it's in a potentially a confirming or a, excuse me, a continuation pattern. So here's a solid uptrend in play. And if I grab the parabola, which I like to use to possibly put in a cup from this top down here to the bottom and now moving back up, you can kind of see this whole cup uh, building. So I'm looking for this to make another run up to 17 and a half and complete this cup. The good news is this is a bullish continuation pattern. So if we do see this get up near 17 and a half and maybe pull back, to around 16 and a half, maybe test that rising 20 day moving average. I think that could set up a really nice entry. And as Julius pointed out, this is a stock that is starting to show some really good strength relative to the S&P 500 moving in that Northeast fashion. So I think Crocs uh, certainly looks very interesting to me as well. Um, I, I, now, you know, I try to time my entries and I think if you look at the reward to the risk where it currently sits, I wouldn't be getting in. But I do think this is an interesting chart to continue to follow. And eventually, uh, it could set up as a great uh, reward to risk trade. So I agree. I, I think Crocs looks good. Home Depot. Uh, home Depot, I like, uh, even though it's in the home improvements group and home improvements, home construction, a lot of those areas have been getting hit a little bit because of the higher treasury yields and the fact that mortgage rates have been moving up. But Home Depot is one of those companies that you know, continues to do extremely well over the long term. And I think short term, this move back in late April, this huge, this is almost a Marabozu candle, which is a candle where you open on the low, close on the high and on heavy volume. It just, it gives you that feeling that there is just nothing but buying that is taking place. And since then, you can see we've been holding the rising 20 day moving average, continuing to push to higher highs and higher lows. So I think that this is a, a stock that's in a really nice uptrend and uh, I would continue to play it as such. I think that this is likely to continue. Watch the rising 20 day moving average for support on pullbacks. So that was number three. Let's keep moving. Uh, we go on to IPI. It's the fourth one and this is Intrepid Potash. Uh, yeah, nice breakout in a flag pattern. Great volume. So let's point out uh, what we're seeing here. Pretty good uh, overhead resistance at about 480. You can see the shooting star from back at the end of December, or excuse me, end of January. We pulled back from that, went all the way back up on very heavy volume, came back down, put in a higher low, 
and then made the breakout. And look at the volume coming in. That to me is also very significant that you're seeing this kind of volume. Look at the volume during the, the prior advance, not really anyone getting behind it. But I think on this move and then followed up with this new high, I think there's a lot of accumulation taking place. It is a smaller stock, so maybe a little bit more risk that you'd have to take here. But I see a move up, sideways consolidation in a flag. The rising 20 day should continue to offer up support. I think IPI looks really good. Uh, next up is JNJ, Johnson and Johnson. Uh, now this one I was fretting a little bit. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure about this one. I, you know, for me, I don't like it for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're still continuing to struggle and moving lower. Um, let me annotate. And I think you can see that the downtrend uh, continues to be in play here. Um, and I don't recall, but my guess, Julius, is that this one was sitting on the left-hand side of the chart, probably, and trying to turn back up. I'm, I just haven't seen that enough of a turn yet to get excited here. Um, also, if you're looking at the volume trends, I'm not seeing on the moves up volume that's as heavy as I see on the moves down. So that's still a little concerning. And then finally, Johnson & Johnson is a multinational company with the dollar rising. I think part of the problem is it's getting swept up in a lot of these larger multinational companies that simply aren't doing as well because money is rotating more towards small caps. So I think there's a number of reasons why for me, I'm not a huge fan of J&J &J at this point. Great company, long-term, no problems whatsoever. But as a short-term trade, I'm not interested. So I'm going to pass on J&J. &J. Lulu. Uh, Lulu looks nice. One negative here is the negative divergence. And so I always like to do this one in the pink color. But here you can see that the uh, PPO is much lower and prices are much higher. Now, we are trending higher. Uh, volume, if volume was heavy here on the breakout, I'd be a little bit more bullish, but it's kind of lessening, it seems like. We're overbought, negative divergence. I like the stock. I like the company. I'd like the chart. I just don't like it here. I would be waiting to see maybe if this negative divergence plays out. I think that there's some risk in it because of the negative divergence and because the breakouts on just so-so volume. Uh, I'm wondering maybe if we're going to get a little bit more pullback, more selling. I would not be shocked to see it pull back to about 95 to test this low. And at that point, you'd be getting close to a 50-day test. I think the reward to risk would be completely different at that point. Again, I'm not, I'm not bearish, Lulu. I certainly wouldn't short it. But from a long perspective, I'd feel better about it if we could get maybe uh, a little bit more of a sustained period of selling. All right, let's go on to WLL, which is our seventh stock. Uh, this one, yeah, I, I think this is the one that was way over on the right side of your chart. Julius, in this, I agree. I think the problem with this one is just that it's overbought. Great looking chart. It's in the energy space. It's one of the leaders. Julius was talking earlier about how ExxonMobil on a relative basis to the energy group is not a great performer, but it is versus the S&P. Well, WLL is just a great performer, period, relative to just about anything you want to pull it up against. Huge move up off the lows of 2250 back in February. We're now at $53. Um, doesn't get much better than that. So we got a huge move. Only problem is it, look at the overbought conditions. I mean, we're talking about RSI at 90, and we've been overbought for about five weeks. So I couldn't buy it here. But what I would do is I'd be keeping it on a, on a um, you know, watch list. And at some point, we'll get a 20-day test, similar to what we got back in here. And you can see what happened off of those 20-day tests. We'll get another one. And at that point, I'd be a little bit more interested. Uh, three more. Nike. Uh, I've talked about Nike. I think it's in a great pattern. I love this, this breakout of this ascending triangle. I won't draw the whole triangle in. I'll just show you the clear, the clear resistance here. Triple top, just up around 70. We broke out above it. Heavy volume. Here were your rising lows. I think this chart looks very good. I would look probably... For another five or six dollars out of this to the upside uh, i did notice earlier nike was the worst performer in the dow it has turned positive but just because it's the worst performer today doesn't mean anything i think it made a bullish breakout it's consolidating today but i think we got some leadership here and i would expect to see nike do very well 
over the course of the next uh, few weeks to few months. Uh, next up, last two, Honeywell. Um, Honeywell, uh, it's right. I don't like today's candle unless it strengthens into today's close because it is at a key area of resistance. I don't like stocks when they break out above key levels of resistance and then can't hold it. So if we get up, you know, we had that earlier high at 150, 109. If we close below 150 today, I think it's just, it's kind of looking like short term, maybe we we might get at a top. Um, things are improving though. The 20 is crossed above the 50. So we got a nice golden cross there. I think if we fail on this breakout today, I would look for maybe a pullback down closer to the rising 20 day, maybe even just gap support around 148. And then I would look for another push to the upside and ultimately a breakout. Um, I do see what could be a bottoming head and shoulder, left shoulder, neckline, head, right side of the neckline, maybe one more pullback could put in that inverse right shoulder before we break out. So I think there's some positives here, but I would be careful about buying here without getting a confirmed breakout on the close. And then the last one is Exxon Mobil. And what I'm gonna do with this one is pull it up and I'm gonna show it on my relative chart, kind of point out what uh, uh, Julius was referring to earlier. So Exxon on the chart here looks pretty good. Let's annotate this. So Exxon is making a nice breakout above a prior high. You got the 20 day moving average rising. So this is why it is performing well versus the S&P 500 because the S&P over the past six, seven weeks is not looking nearly as well or as strong as Exxon Mobil. So we're getting some nice relative strength versus the S&P 500. And that's this is what uh, was being reflected on the RRG chart. You can see Exxon Mobil bottomed relative to the S&P back uh, a couple months ago and has been moving higher. The uh, group, the industry group has been very strong relative to the S&P 500, but look at Exxon relative to its peers. This is what Julius was referring to. It's not exactly. Yeah, it's not that it's a bad stock. It actually is, is looking pretty good technically, but a lot of it is it's being dragged higher by its overall group, which is very strong and has been very strong for the past couple of months. So I agree wholeheartedly. I think Exxon looks good. And if that was my only choice to invest in Exxon or to invest in the S&P 500, I like Exxon. But that's not my only choice. There are a lot of other stocks I can choose from and a lot of other energy stocks. And I think I'd probably choose elsewhere. But Exxon does does look OK to me. And that is the 10 in 10. So we can go ahead and pull that summary up. And you can take a look at the stocks that we just spoke about. Um, and I don't know if you had any comments on any of those as I went through, particularly like something like Johnson & Johnson. Julius, I mean, I know that you're looking maybe for that reversal as it's starting to turn up. But when you looked at that chart uh, on Johnson & Johnson, would you be waiting for maybe a certain level to be cleared before you would act on what you're seeing. Yeah, well, I, I just picked it off the RRG, but as I always tell people and, and you know, um, never just plainly rely on an RRG itself um, because it is only one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I picked uh, Johnson & Johnson is because it is turning up. It's inside the um, lagging quadrant on the daily, but it's moving higher. So that's, that's the reason I picked it and it was asked. So it was on the list. I thought, you know, this could be it. But I always look at the at the chart itself uh, before pulling the trigger on anything. And, you know, some of these some of these picks are a little bit more gutsy and bold than, than others. Mm -hmm. Let me quickly uh, check that chart. Yeah. You know, as a matter of fact, that Johnson & Johnson chart, if I look at the weekly in combination with my RRG indicators, I'm doing that right now offline, you know, that relative strength is pretty much going nowhere. And it looks like we have a pretty big descending triangle forming on the weekly chart. And the uptrend that started mid-2015 has been broken. So I'd be very reluctant to buy J&J &J right here, maybe for a little bounce, but that's it. Gotcha. All right, cool. Um, all right, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on. Appreciate your uh, contribution there, Julius. That was awesome. And that was a really good demonstration of how you can use the RRG and look for those stocks because many of the stocks we pulled up, I think, were, were textbook uh, from a trading perspective uh, because they were weakening on the right side of the, that RRG chart and mm -hmm. turning back up into that strengthening area or the, the strongest quadrant. 
And I do think that, that coincides a lot of times with what I look for, which is pullbacks in a, in a, a, a chart that's been trending higher. I like to buy those pullbacks. So I think that right side in that weakening quadrant, as it starts to turn back up, I'll, I think that can give you some great signals. So, yeah, we're going to be good friends. Yep, yep, no doubt. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on. I do want to mention that we have ChartCon upcoming. Julius is going to be there along with uh, many others. And uh, we've got a, what a great list of uh, speakers. I'm going to go ahead and show everyone what a tremendous uh, conference this is. It is August 10th and 11th. It's hard to believe that, I mean, we're, you know, on the tail end of May, we're getting ready to head into June. So it won't be long. We'll be staying it's two months away and uh, it's crazy, but you, it is an online conference. There will be some that'll be there with us, but for the most part, most of the folks attending will be attending online. Uh, so you can be watching it from wherever you want to watch it, wherever you've got your laptop and a, and an internet connection, you'll be able to tune into ChartCon. The, uh, there's an explanation here on the page, talks about uh, how all of us are going to try to protect ourselves. Uh, you saw the volatility we just went through. This is going to be the theme this year, is uh, protecting ourselves. Um, you know, Everyone's got different strategies for minimizing risk. Here's the group, the list. Here's the agenda as you scroll down. All you have to do is go to stockcharts.com slash chartcon, and you'll have this page. Uh, and Julius, I mention this all the time, uh, uh, but you are the closer. You are the <laughs> closer. So they know what they know yeah. what they were doing. They're like, all right, we're bringing in the RRG. We're bringing in the heavy artillery. Close up the chart gun. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. For those of you who don't know, Julius saw his first baseball game last year, and I, so I wanted to use that closer analogy from baseball, where they bring in the the pitcher at the end of the game to save the game. That's it. It's the most important pitcher of the game. So you're in that spot, Julius. No, no pressure. I just, I just, you know, I'm, I, you know, I don't know all the rules of baseball, but you, you play a number of innings, and I'm just the one that just brings the game home, you know, because we've had such a good match, and you know, it's we're we're gonna we're gonna be winning anyway. So I just have to bring the game home. That's what I'm. That's what I need to do. Yep. There you go. So anyway. Uh, ChartCon coming up August 10th and 11th. Let's move on. We got a quick market update before we get into Julius's technical scanning. I'm going to make this really quick. Uh, here is a candle glance of what's going on. Let me just refresh, make sure I got the last minute information here. The Dow Jones, though, is uh, moving higher again. We are up over 300 points, up 316, trying to clear that 25,000 level. It's been a couple months since we've been able to do that. The S&P 500 also trying to negotiate its prior high. The NASDAQ may be on a relative basis here over the last week, uh, just weakening a bit. That's not the case, though, with the small caps having another nice day. Small caps up another 10 points today. The Wilshire 500 also breaking out to a new high. 10-year Treasury yield still hovering around that 3.07% level, taking a break. The dollar just remains on its tear to the upside, only up a penny today. But these uh, past four weeks or so have just been amazing to watch the dollar move. Commodities going up with the dollar. Uh, not you know normally you think that the commodities will pull back. That's more of a gold thing than it is a dollar thing. And if you go all the way down here and take a look at the GLD with the dollar rising last four to six weeks, look what gold's doing. Gold's going down. A rising dollar, you know, there could be a number of reasons why the dollar moves higher. Uh, strong, stronger economy uh, here in the U.S. is one of the one of the reasons, and that can improve commodities as well. So don't be too uh, alarmed by commodities going up with the dollar. It's really gold. That's the one that tends to move inverse. The U.S. oil fund, you can see having another nice day today, up another 16 cents above 1450. Volatility continues uh, moving lower. And for our friends in Canada, here is the TSX also doing very well, has been doing well here over the past uh, five or six weeks. And uh, with that, we are going to move in. I'm going to let Julius take over for this segment. He's got some interesting stuff for you. He, he showed you his Monday setups earlier in the show. Julius, let everybody know how you came up with these picks. Yes, I will do that. Let me take over the screen from you. And, um, you know, please be aware that, you know, I am, I know all my stuff about RRG on stockcharts.com, but one of the things that I'm still, you know, learning on and off every day, every week is, is the other tools that we have. And obviously the, um, the scanning tool is very, very powerful. So in my temporary new role as Tom's co-host, I thought I'd like to, you know, Take you on a little journey with me on how I uh, learned a little bit of um, of the scanning syntax and the toolage that I used. Um, 
for that, I brought up a, a an idea that I've been using um, years ago, actually. It comes from uh, from a very well-known book called Street Smarts by Larry Connors and Linda Rashke. If you don't know it, um, you know, look it up. It's not it's not a cheap book. It's an expensive book, um, but it's very well written and it's got a number of very nice uh, swing trading strategies or techniques. It's not full fledged trading systems, you know, exit entries, etc. It's pretty much setups. And they advise you on the money management. That's but that's basically for you to figure out. They will give you the entries, and you'll figure out depending on your trading style um, when you want to exit. So this strategy is called Turtle Soup, and um, it it refers loosely to the uh, to the trading group called the Turtles, who many of you probably have seen or, or known of before. Um, they are a big trend following group. They trade, they break trade outs and the 20 day breakout is a big thing for them. Um, what Connors and Rashke have noticed that these 20 day breakouts, um, can be very, very profitable, but very often go wrong. So you got failed breakouts, which is very typical for a trend following system. Um, you know, a typical trend following system, if you test it, you got 30 to 40% profitable trades, but you got 60 to 70% losing trades but the big secret is that your winning trades are much much bigger than your losing trades which is why it is a profitable strategy so commas and rashki being much more shorter term swing trading oriented thought let's try to find a way to take the opposite of that breakout trade so we want to look for the 60 to 70 percent failing breakouts and get in on the other side of that trade and that's what the turtle soup strategy does by the way the turtle soup name was came up if you read it in a book it came out during a conversation it could have been come up during market watches live tom and aaron me and tom me and aaron you know joking around about names and strategies and that's how it it, it got out there and it got stuck like a lot of other strategy names that are out there now we have very little time i believe but let's go very very quickly um the turtle soup setup it the, the first rule is that today the market must make a new 20 day low and the lower that low, the better. Very simple. You look for the lowest low of the last 20 days it has to be today. The second thing that we're going to look for is that the previous 20 day low must have occurred at least four trading sessions earlier. This is very important. So, you know, we're going to look at a chart later on, but try to visualize this. So we have a, we have a market that comes to a 20 day low. Now the previous 20 day low was a minimum of four sessions earlier. So it already sold off, then bounced for at least four sessions, and then it's coming down again. So it's basically what Tom was just talking about with his fades and his failing breakouts, et cetera, et cetera. That's pretty much what we're gonna look for. Now, if during the day, the market falls below its prior 20 day low, you're gonna place a buy stop five to 10 ticks above that previous 20 day low. So let's assume it was four days ago. So the 20 day low is four days ago. Today, we're dropping below that 20 day low. And as soon as we, as we register new lows for the day, we're gonna put our buy stop in a couple of ticks above that previous 20 day low. That stop, that buy stop is only good for today. So if that stop starts, that stop continues to plummet and move down and never look back, obviously we're not going to get stopped into our trade. So if it's a, if it's a, um, a good breakout and it breaks out low and it starts to move down, we're not in the trade. If it bounces back, if the break fails, we, we place a good to can, good till canceled sell stop one take under today's low. So we got a we got a very close stop because we expect this break to fail and start to move the other side. So um, once we stopped in, we got a very close stop and we're going to watch this trade move higher, hopefully. And then when the position becomes profitable, you can use a trailing stop to protect your gain. However you want to do that, ATR base, three day low, whatever type of stop you want, all good for us, you know, as long as you put a stop in to protect yourself, that'll do it. Now there's one re-entry rule that if you're stopped out on day one or two of the trade, you can re-enter at exactly the same level, um, but only on day one or two of the trade. Now, this is an example of how this, uh, this looks. You have 
and this is this is where it's happening. So forget all the bars to the right. This is the low. It makes a 20 day low. This was the previous 20 day low and this period here is 20 days. So you've got, you've got your 20 day low. During the day, it opens here, it drops below it, not much, but you know, it's not the best example, but it, it, it did the job. And then it starts to move higher. It closes here and then it moves higher during the day. So whatever your exit is. So this is the type of setups that we are looking for. If we zoom in this one, this looks a little bit bigger. So here, here starts the 20 day period. Today is a 20 day low, nothing lower be before. This is the previous 20 day low and we're bounced back and we pick it up as soon as it bounces back above that 210.39 level for this stock. Now, clearly we wanna scan for this. So we're gonna use the S&P 500. So the group is S&P 500. Today, the market must make a new 20 day low. So that would be the low equals minus 20 comma low. That is true if today's low is the lowest of the 20 days. Now, be, bear in mind that this is the last condition that we wanna scan for, because this is actually uh, our setup. Now, we have to make sure that we find the prior 20 day low at least four sessions earlier. Now, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So what we do is we wanna say that four days ago low, the low of four days ago equals the 20 day low. And also that one, two and three days after the 20 day low is smaller than that low. I hope you can still follow me. So we had that 20 day low four days ago and then the day after, the day after, the day before, the day before. So this is today. So we've got zero, one, two, three, four has to be higher than the, the 20 day low, which was made four days ago. If that happens, then we have to, to reiterate through that requirement for five sessions, six sessions, seven sessions, eight sessions, et cetera, et cetera, because it, it's not necessarily the four day low, but also um, fifth, sixth, seventh, eight, et cetera. And this is how you do it. So you got your five day, your one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. Tom, we're going to run into time problems, I see. Um, so well, maybe what we can do, um, you know, maybe what we can do is, is uh, we'll have some time tomorrow or maybe yes. at the end of your uh, of your workshop tomorrow. Maybe you can. I'll, I'll stuff this into the workshop because it would be a pity if I just, you know, do it very, very quickly. But people who want to play with it, they can start working with the code that I just give you. And then tomorrow I'll give you the the full set of code and rules and we'll, we'll write it out in the blog, et cetera. Um, so to wrap it up, if you've set up all these uh, blocks of requirements, so the, the fifth day, the sixth day, and all the days after it need to be bigger than the 20 day low, then we need to look for a situation where um, the, and, and you can do two things. You can do it based on end of day data. So you run the scan after your market close. What I do is I will look for stocks within n percent of the 20 day low. So the, the, the code would look like the close needs to be smaller or equal than the 20 day low times 1.03%, 4%, 5%, et cetera. Or when you run the scan during the day, you will simply put in the first one that we had, the low equal. So that, this is when actually a 20 day low has been made today. And you know that you have to look at what that low was to put in your, uh, your entry stop and wait for that entry stop to be, uh, to be triggered. Um, we are at 7.24 now. Let's not, that, 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 would be, uh, that would be a shame. I've got the code for you. I'll talk about it tomorrow after my introduction of RRG. I'll bring the two together and show you how I run the code get the names from the scan, throw them at an RRG and bundle the two together and how I came up with the names that I give you today for, uh, for the Monday market setups. Is that a, is that a deal? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, that'll, you'll have plenty of time tomorrow where you can bring it up and I think it'll cool. fit in 
it'll fit right in with your discussion on the RR. Not a problem. That'll be, that'll be awesome. So why don't we go ahead and bring that poll up then. Um, let everybody take a look. Uh, there's a poll showing six Dow stocks. And, uh, you know, it's given everybody plenty of time to take a look at the charts to see which one uh, everyone feels is most bullish. And I'm going to, I don't know if you looked at these charts, uh, Julius, but if you haven't, maybe take a quick look and, or maybe you already know, which, which of the six stocks do you think is most bullish right now? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> put you on the spot. Yeah, let's go for GE because that's been really bullish and it came from such a, a long way ago. So this is this this baby has been you know picked up by the rest of the world. Um, maybe Apple. My, I don't know, let, let, I'm just doing this on top of my head, but I'll go for uh, General Electric just because it has been so weak for so long. So it's probably got a lot to catch up to do. Yeah, you know, I've, I like all six of them to be honest. Yeah, me too. But I need you. You told me to pick one. Yeah, I told you to pick one. I didn't say I had to pick one. <laughs> uh, you're new. Because uh, it's, it's your birthday, so you're allowed to do that. Yeah, it's my birthday, and you're subbing yeah. for Aaron, so I'm going to make the rules for you today. Yada, yada, yada. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, GE would probably be my pick, but I'm going to go ahead and pick another one just because uh, we've, we've spoken so much about GE, so I don't want to talk any more about it. But I'm going to pull up a chart of one of these stocks, and I'm going to show it to you. And this is the one I'm going to go with. I'm going with United Health. Um, first of all, it is at resistance. So I want to see this breakout today, but I'm, I'm assuming that this is how it's going to close today. And I really like this breakout, getting back up through that January high. The other thing that I like, and I spoke about this earlier in the month, or maybe it was in later April, if you pull up the seasonal uh, chart on UNH, it's one of the best performing Dow stocks in the month of May. And so you take a look here over the last 20 years, uh, UNH has gone up 75% of uh, May's and it's averaged going up 2.4%. And outside of the November, December period, which obviously is very bullish, and then uh, slight outperformance in March, this 2.4% on average is pretty strong for, for UNH. And I realize it's already gone up that, but that's just an average. There have been plenty of years where it's gone up more than that in May. And so I think that this move to the upside is very sustainable technically, seasonally, it makes sense. Um, I do think that, you know, the Dow is probably going to play some catch up pretty soon. The small caps have just been, uh, they've been outperformers. And I think that's going to continue, by the way. I think that that's a theme we can count on, but I think UNH would be the pick. So I'm going to go with that. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, wrap up, talk about some of the things that we're going to be going on the rest of this week, because we do have a busy schedule. And uh, I know tomorrow, Julius, uh, you will be back in here with me. And I really appreciate you coming in and subbing for Aaron, who's getting a couple of well-deserved days off. And uh, you're going to do the workshop tomorrow on RRG. Yes. For those of you who are unfamiliar with RRG, you want to be in here tomorrow uh, to check this out because Julius is going to give you a lot of good information, uh, really what an RRG is. And I'm not going to steal his thunder, but uh, it'll be a great presentation. Dave Keller will be joining us on uh, Wednesday. Of course, everything stock charts on Friday. And I do want to mention happy Memorial Day for next Monday. Uh, really appreciate everybody stopping by and being with us today. Please remember to complete that survey as you exit. We love to get your feedback. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Monday afternoon, everybody. Hopefully see you back here tomorrow on Tuesday. Happy trading.